Well, if you're tuning into this program in the hope that for the third night in a row, I will begin by reading new passages of a 69-page civil complaint in a lawsuit filed in Manhattan on Monday accusing Rudolph Giuliani of sexual harassment, sexual assault, withholding wages, federal income tax evasion, and selling pardons for $2 million, which he split with Donald Trump. I am sorry to disappoint you. For the last two nights, I have read to you all of the most important passages in that 69-page complaint that I can actually say on television. As grotesque as most of what I've already read to you this week sounds, it does not include the most graphic parts of the complaint. Rodolfo Giuliani has stayed absolutely silent for the now more than 48 hours that these written accusations were made public in court. On Monday afternoon, a spokesperson for Giuliani issued a written statement saying that he denies the accusations. That's it. If you're wondering why there hasn't been much more coverage of this lawsuit on television, it might be because there are so few parts of the complaint that can actually be read on television. The most serious accusation in the document that includes Donald Trump is about selling pardons for $2 million during the Trump presidency. As I mentioned on Monday, when I read that passage to you, it appears on the same page in the complaint where there is a screenshot of Rudolph Giuliani's text to his employee, Noel Dunphy, who is suing him, saying, can I shower with you? On the top of that page, is the story about the $2 million pardons. Quote, Giuliani also asked Ms. Dunphy if she knew anyone in need of a pardon, telling her that he was selling pardons for $2 million, which he and President Trump would split. He told Ms. Dunphy that she could refer individuals seeking pardons to him so long as they did not go through the normal channels of the Office of the Pardon Attorney because correspondence going to that office would be subject to disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Rudolph Giuliani has let that accusation sit for over two full days now, while he maintains complete silence about it. Donald Trump's last Senate-confirmed attorney general was asked about the possibility of Rudolph Giuliani selling two million dollar pardons and he didn't exactly offer a strong defense i want to ask you two more things one is a 70 page complaint that was filed in state court in new york on monday this is someone who worked for rudy giuliani who alleges not only sexual assault and harassment but that she has evidence that he tried to sell pardons for two million dollars apiece which he and president trump would split do you think that that's possible? Uh, you know, I, I'm skeptical about that. I don't. I don't think Rudy Giuliani would do that. Uh, I hope he wouldn't. Uh, but mm, I don't know. I don't know. I hope he wouldn't. But I don't know. William Barr knows Rudolph Giuliani well. William Barr knows Donald Trump well. And when asked if those two could have teamed up to sell $2 million pardons and split the money, William Barr's answer is, I don't know. Ask that question of any other attorney general who was not appointed by Donald Trump or Richard Nixon, and you would get a very, very strong answer to that accusation, a very strong uh, defense against an accusation like that. But to the question, was Rudy Giuliani selling pardons for $2 million and splitting the money with Donald Trump? William Barr's best answer, as we saw him think about it, pause and think about it. His best answer is, I don't know. Donald Trump's answer to questions on CNN last week might have provoked one of his lawyers to quit. About the documents the FBI seized 
with a search warrant from Donald Trump's residence in Florida, Donald Trump said, I took the documents. I am allowed to. He actually said those words. Today, Timothy Parlatore, one of the lawyers defending Donald Trump in special prosecutor Jack Smith's criminal investigation of Donald Trump, quit. Jack Smith served a subpoena on Mr. Parlatore that forced him to testify to the grand jury investigating the documents case. Last month, in a letter to the Republican-controlled House Intelligence Committee, Mr. Parlatore said that the documents ended up in Florida by accident. It's just a mistake. He claimed that the Trump staff, quote, quickly packed everything into boxes and shipped them to Florida. He claimed that none of the classified documents ended up at the Trump Florida residence because of, quote, intentional decisions by President Trump. Donald Trump turned that letter into a lie on CNN last week when he said, I took the documents, I'm allowed to. Donald Trump, in effect, repeatedly labeled that lawyer's letter that was sent to Congress as false. Why did you take those documents with you when you left the White I House? I had every right to under the Presidential Records Act. You have the Presidential Records Act. I was there and I took what I took and it gets declassified. Why did you not turn them over when you got a subpoena because we asking were negotiating for you to turn with them over? Them. We were negotiating with them. And by the way, they become automatically declassified when I took them. And now the lawyer whose letter to Congress completely disagrees with that has quit. The automatically declassified defense is apparently under more stress than ever tonight, with CNN reporting on the contents of a letter from the National Archives to Donald Trump, informing him that the archives is going to hand over to Special Prosecutor Jack Smith 16 records. The letter says the 16 records in question all reflect communications involving close presidential advisors, some of them directed to you personally, concerning whether, why, and how you should declassify certain classified records. If none of those documents say that Donald Trump could automatically declassify documents simply by taking them home, then Donald Trump will be in even more trouble when Jack Smith gets those documents scheduled to be delivered to him from the National Archives next week. In Manhattan, where Donald Trump is a criminal defendant, he received some clarification from the district attorney about the other crimes the district attorney believes Donald Trump intended to commit as a result of committing the crime of falsifying business records to cover up Donald Trump's $130,000 cash payment of hush money to actress Stormy Daniels. In a court filing, the district attorney said, quote, the crimes defendant intended to commit or to aid or conceal may include violations of New York election law, New York tax law, New York penal law, or and or violations of the Federal Election Campaign Act. So George Santos is still sitting right there with you. Uh, he could have been sent out of that building tonight, but Republicans protected him. That's right. In fact, what the Republicans did is that they filed a motion to refer George Santos to the Ethics Committee, as you said. The same resolution that was to be voted on today, uh, that was ultimately referred to the Ethics Committee, had already been referred to the Ethics Committee on February 9th. And if the Republicans and Kevin McCarthy actually wanted to hold George Santos's feet to the fire, if any of their words meant anything today, there were many ways that they could have done it. None of those ways includes doing what they did, which is essentially a complete cop out, punting this uh, resolution to avoid an up or down vote on whether or not to expel George Santos. And you heard Congressman D'Esposito say uh, on the House floor that he supports expelling George Santos. Well, if you support expelling George Santos, 
then why don't you convince your leadership to take an up or down vote on whether or not he should be expelled? You are avoiding the issue, and that is exactly what this Republican Party did. And what essentially they're saying is we are siding with George Santos uh, in making sure that he remains in Congress. Uh, you know, this is an audience that understands a parliamentary procedure in the House and the Senate, and they can't be fooled into thinking that there is any Republican in the House of Representatives who actually supports expelling George Santos. None of them do. They all had a chance to do it. None of them participated in it. They're, they're all very clearly holding on to him. And if you're looking for proof, if you're kind of looking around trying to figure out, what was this vote really about? How did George Santos vote? Oh, I'm sure he voted to support it, just like George, he voted George to... George Santos <laughs> voted to send the expulsion resolution to the Ethics Committee because it was the Protect George Santos Day by the Republicans on the House floor. That, that's right, Lawrence. And there, as you know, and, and as, as a parliamentary, parliamentary expert, there are many ways that the Speaker and the Republicans could have held George Santos to account. But what they did is they punted it to the Ethics Committee, and we all know the Ethics Committee is going to wait until DOJ plays out. So this was a way of avoiding having to take a difficult vote on whether or not to expel George Santos. Because everybody knows that someone who is a complete fraud, who deceived all of his voters to become a member of Congress, who has admitted to committing fraud in Brazil, who's been charged with a variety of different fraud counts here, does not belong in Congress. But the Republicans want him to stay in Congress because all they care about is his power. And so they but they want to avoid accountability for keeping him in Congress to the best of their ability. But you and your viewers and certainly we on the Democratic side see right through it. So Kevin McCarthy now has George Santos's vote in the House of Representatives until uh, his the criminal case against George Santos reaches a verdict, which could be uh, basically the rest of George Santos's current term. Yeah, these things traditionally could take a, at least a year. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen with the George Santos indictment. But what is very clear is based on the Republicans move today, they are not going to take any action against George Santos until his criminal case is resolved. They will talk all about how they want an ethics report. They want it to move quickly and all this stuff. It, it's not going to move quickly. It has been paused and will be paused to defer to the Department of Justice. If they wanted to move it quickly, they could have postponed the resolution for 30 days or 60 days when they would expect a report back from the Ethics Committee. They did not do that because they want this to they want George Santos simply to stay in Congress. In your crusade to try to bring some ethics oversight uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, what did you learn today in the hearing about what has been happening with Clarence Thomas and possibly others in financial disclosure forms? Well, the most important thing to understand is that these allegations about yacht and jet travel from the same right-wing billionaire were actually raised first back in 2011. And that was sent for its disposition to the Judicial Conference and within the Judicial Conference to its Financial Disclosure Committee, which is the exact same thing that has been done with the current allegations regarding Justice Thomas. So what they did then is very important to understand regarding what they're likely to do now. And what they did then, a judge who was on the Judicial Conference at the time explained, was to basically ask and answer the wrong question and to use a procedure that prevented any of this from becoming public. So uh, as we look forward to the Judicial Conference considering this latest set of allegations, which are now repeat offender allegations, uh, one can hope that they will do a different job than was done a decade ago.
Was there any uh, indication of any disagreement within the conference when they examined this issue in the past? Yeah. Uh, in fact, our witness raised questions about why it wasn't being brought up to the judicial conference when he knew that it was being assigned to this financial disclosure committee of the judicial conference. They're supposed to report back up to the judicial conference so that you then get the chance for the whole judicial conference to understand what took place and make its own determination. So when that didn't happen, he expressed concern and um, did not have any luck getting results at the time. So, you know, life goes on. He went on back to being a senior important uh, judge. And then um, when he saw this, he realized, wait a minute, this rings a bell. And uh, we had him in as a witness to testify about what took place before. So what would you have to do on your disclosure form as a Supreme Court justice to trigger any kind of investigative interest at all uh, through this kind of process? If, for example, you're going to completely leave out your wife's income, which is yeah. much greater than yours, much greater than yours, you're just going to leave that out, violate the rule on the form and leave it out. That leads to nothing. Can anything that you do or don't do on those forms lead to anything? What the law requires of these judges is that they determine whether or not there's reasonable cause to believe that the failure to file was willful. And if there's reasonable cause, then they don't make a decision about willfulness. It's like a probable cause hearing for a search warrant. At that point, you then refer it to the attorney general, and the attorney general makes the willfulness determination. What they did a decade ago appears to have been to actually make the willfulness determination, take that responsibility away from the attorney general, set a much higher bar than reasonable cause, and the result was there was no action taken and there was no public record even emerging from the regular public records of the judicial conference. So uh, if they do send it to the attorney general, then what happens? Then the attorney general makes a determination whether to pursue civil or criminal fines based on an independent evaluation of what uh, took place. And one of the important things about this judge's testimony was that he made very clear that there's a very important role to have the attorney general come in and make this determination, because when it's all judges and they all have to deal with each other and there's a lot of collegiality, it's important from a checks and balances point of view to actually get to another branch of government, which is why the proper question is, was there reasonable cause, not was there willfulness? And when the uh, system failed to do that, that was a, a breakdown that we hope won't be repeated. Plus, now this is the second time. So the case for willfulness is much stronger because of the previous 2011 experience. And, and I just want to take this one more step for the audience, because I, I know they're wondering, uh, since they're, they don't expect to see any uh, discipline of a, of a Supreme Court justice, I just want to go through the theory of it. If the attorney general determined that this is a willful violation of the disclosure forms, willful decision to never disclose the spouse's income, and the attorney general believes that this is worthy of criminal sanction, what kind of criminal sanction could the attorney general pursue? Well, there are civil fines if he chooses to proceed civilly. There are criminal fines if he chooses to proceed criminally. And if he took this really seriously, there is a federal statute, uh, USC Section 1001, which is a very well-known uh, statute called the False Statements Law. And if you make a false statement uh, in a uh, federal matter, like, for instance, disclosing federally required uh, material, then that's a flat-out criminal offense, standard DOJ prosecutive fare.